Welcome, my name is Pastor Scotty Bockhaus, and we thank you for taking some time to listen to some audio recordings from the pulpit of the Riverview Baptist Church. Our desire is to show the Lord high, holy, and lift it up, as well as try to be a blessing to those through the Word of God. Please enjoy this message, and we pray that it will be a blessing to your life. You wouldn't mind to take your copy of the Word of God and turn with me to the book of 2 Peter. The book of 2 Peter, and, or 1 Peter, 1 Peter chapter 1. We're in the book of 1 Peter, 1 Peter chapter number 1. We are in our series, the beginning of our series of the survey of the book of 1 Peter, walking through it, uh, and the idea is to strengthen the brethren. Now, last time we met for Sunday school, we had gave a character study on what Jesus Christ had done in Peter's life and the commandment and the prophecy that Peter, when thou art converted, strengthen the brethren. And we know that the writings of the book of 1 Peter and 2 Peter were the fulfillment of that prophecy with the idea that these were intended to strengthen us up. And so as we go through here, each of the titles are going to be showing areas that we could be strengthened up based off the passage that we read. Now as we come to the book of 1 Peter in chapter number 1, let's start together in verse 1. 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse number 1. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the, scatter, to the strangers scattered throughout Pontus, Galatius, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through the sanctification of the Spirit unto the obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Grace unto you and peace be multiplied. And if you're in the habit of marking things in your Bible, notice one word that we find in the book of 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 1. Notice the word strangers. With this, we could see Peter... In the same verse as these strangers, we'll define the idea of strangers in just a second. But with this, we're going to see the idea through this passage of to be strong in a strange land. To be strong in a strange land. Peter and the strangers. If you don't mind, let's go to the Lord to <laughs> and let's examine this with the Lord's help. Now, the great theme of the book of First Peter is the Christian hope in the time of suffering and travail, knowing that persecution is right around the corner, knowing that now is the time to learn to be strong in the Lord before all of this hits, before the first wave uh, of persecution hits, that they are to learn to be strong. Now as Peter is writing this, notice this, that he writes to the strangers which are scattered abroad. These are referring to the diaspora, that's a famous word that's used, dealing with the Hebrew people who are scattered around the world, and specifically the Hebrew believers. That the Hebrew people had been scattered because of the destruction of Jerusalem in 586 BC, and then once again scattered in 70 AD. And now as the Hebrew people are scattered, and many, some of them have accepted Christ as their Savior, Peter is writing with a direct address to the Hebrew people, though it also applies to us as Gentile believers. But he's writing, talking about them as strangers. What does it mean to be strangers? Well, the word strangers carries the idea that they're not a part of. We are strangers in this world. We're in a strange land. We're in a land that doesn't belong to us. That the world is not our home. We're just a passing through. That our home, we're citizens of heaven. But we have to live in this world. But not yet belong to this world. We are strangers. We're not like the rest of the world. We don't think like the rest of the world. We don't operate like the rest of the world. And because of that, there is a difference. That word difference is going to be an important word that we're going to find out throughout the whole book of 1 Peter, this principle of being different. The greatest evidence that biblical Christianity is true, the greatest evidence that biblical Christianity is true is the evidence of a different life. 
You see, as Christians, we are not better than anyone else. We are different than everyone else. Does that make sense? We don't ever need to get to the place where we feel like we're better than others. We are just different. And because we're different, we're going to stand out. By the way, this is why Christians have a hard time when it comes to persecution. They have a hard time with dealing with the world because they don't like to be different. We like to fit in. We like people to recognize us. We want the attaboys. We want the accolades. We want the people to recognize us. But if we're going to follow after Christ, but just by following Christ, we will be different. This makes us strangers. This makes us people passing through in a strange land because we are different. Now, this is going to be part of the recognition, part of the preparation that we have to recognize we are strangers. We are different. And we have to learn to follow after Christ because soon there's going to be a price paid for being different. Does it make sense? So we're in the book of 1 Peter chapter 1 and we're giving the introduction and we're seeing the word strangers and that we are strangers in this land. We don't belong to this land. Our land is somewhere else. And here is encouragement that we are to be strong in a strange land. As we go here and examine this introduction, the first thing I'd like to show you here is Peter the Apostle. Peter, the apostle, it starts off in 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 1. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ. Now, of course, Peter is just a fascinating study to look at his life. If you were to look at Peter's life before he came to know the Lord, you would say, well, there's some man, he's, he's <laughs> a mind of his own. You know, Peter was a specimen. He was a rugged fisherman, grew up in that fishing business. He had to weather the waves. He had to go through the storms. He was someone himself who knew what it was for hard work. He was someone who was also strong. You say, really? Remember the time where he quit and he went a fishing and made all these other preachers go with him. And they had quit the ministry. They were going to go back to the fishing business. And um, Jesus spoke to them and told them, put the nets of the other side. And they had a, a nets full of 143 huge fish, so much that the nets were breaking. And the rest of the disciples struggled to get it up on the boat. When they finally got to the shore, you remember what happened? Peter took it all by himself and just picked it up. He was a specimen. He was a rugged fisherman. He was big and strong, but probably not what you would expect to be the leader of the church when you first met him. You look at him and say, he's going to be a religious leader? No, he's uneducated. He's backwoods. He's at a place where he hung out with his fisherman buddies. But what happened? He met the Lord Jesus Christ and it changed his life. By the way, who was it that brought him to Christ? It was his brother Andrew. It talks about his brother Andrew went on purpose to find his brother Simon. And he told him about the Lord. Andrew the soul winner. When he met Jesus, God transformed Peter's life. And his life is different. So much now that Peter's name is actually inscribed in the gates of heaven. You could read about that in the book of Revelation. That he, him and the twelve apostles. Speaking of apostles. G, Peter an apostle of Jesus Christ. What is the qualification to be an apostle? Well notice in the book of Acts chapter 1. And let's actually look. What does it mean to be an apostle? The word apostle in its very basic meaning. Carries the idea of sent one. Remember that the original 12, one of them was a traitor. And so after he left, they went through the process of putting another one in his place. And I want you to notice the qualifications that were given in order to be an apostle. Notice with me in the book of Acts chapter 1. The book of Acts chapter 1. And I want you to see what the requirements were to be an apostle. Starting at verse number 20. Uh, Acts chapter 1 verse 20. For it is written in the book of Psalms. Let his habitation be desolate. No man 
dwell therein and his bishopric let another take. Meaning that it was prophesied in the book of Psalms that there was going to be one that was going to have to be replaced. Verse 21 starts the requirements. Wherefore of these men which have companied with us all the time that Jesus went in and out among us. The first requirement to be an apostle is that he had to be in and among the disciples. He had to know what Jesus taught. He had to be a part of it during that three and a half year stretch. He had to be in the school with Jesus. That's a requirement. Let's pause there. Does anyone fit the requirements of apostle today? No. This was something, a special office just for this time. Notice this, a second requirement Beginning from the baptism of John, here's the second requirement, they had to have gone to John the Baptist and followed John the Baptist in baptism. And that's a thing all of its own. Remember that John the Baptist was the forerunner. He prepared the way of Christ. And so what they're trying to do is trying to place that this new replacement, this new apostle actually had to have been there with John the Baptist. We know that Peter And the gospel records had been a follower of John the Baptist. And then when John the Baptist said, I must decrease, but he must increase. Then he says, behold, the Lamb of God that followeth, uh, that, that, who was shed before the foundation of the world. And Peter and Andrew and them said, okay, we're going to follow him. And so Peter fit, fit that bill. It was part of the requirements. And then verse 22, beginning at the baptism of John unto the day, he must be taken up from us, be must one ordained to be witness with us of his resurrected. The third requirement is that they had to see the resurrected body of Jesus Christ. And so as we talk about Peter, the apostle, he was a sent one, he was chosen, but he had been with Jesus from the beginning. He had been with John the Baptist, the forerunner, and he had seen the resurrected Jesus Christ. So what we're seeing here is that God has used Peter and has brought him to the place where he has learned what it is to follow after Christ, to make a choice to follow after Christ. And now, as he is addressing the people who are about to go through persecution, he is giving the qualifications that he has God's authority To help us to address these things. Because he has the evidence of a changed life. That there was a time he met the Lord and it changed him. May I pause here? Do you have an evidence of a changed life? Is your life different from before you came to know the Lord from the time after you met the Lord? If there is no difference, then there is something wrong. There must be a difference There must be some difference between the time before you came to know the Lord to the time after you named the Lord. That God has made us a new creature. Behold, all things have passed away. Behold, all things become new. God has changed us as he did the Apostle Peter. That this is the evidence that God can change lives. With this, as we go on in the book of 1 Peter chapter 1, not only do we see here Peter the Apostle, but we follow up with the people of God. The people of God. Notice with me again in verse number 1. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the strangers scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. Here he begins to address them and it tells about the strangers, these believers that are scary, uh, scattered everywhere. Notice that God provided the same care and the keeping for the strangers as he did for Peter. That no matter where they are, God is watching over them. Notice it later on in the book of 1 Peter as he addresses these strangers even more. Notice with me in uh, chapter 2 verse 12. Chapter 2 verse 12. Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts, which war against the souls. Notice he addresses them as strangers and pilgrims. He is telling us about what we're going to do in this world. The idea of a pilgrim carries the idea of someone who is alongside of, meaning that there's a separation. They're, they're different And so pilgrims, as we are pilgrims as defined in the Bible, that we're in the world, but we're not of the world. There 
is something different. Remember, our world is not our home. We're looking for something better that God has planned for us. We are pilgrims. There is something different. Now, the letter of 1 Peter was written by Peter, an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the strangers, those in the world among the people. The word of God teaches that we are to be separate. Why should we be separate? In order to be a witness to the lost. The greatest evidence that Bible Christianity is true is the evidence of of a changed life. So because of this, we are commanded to be different. Notice with me, if you don't mind, one of these commands in the book of 1 Corinthians. Uh, sorry, 2 Corinthians chapter 6. 2 Corinthians chapter 6. And I want you to see for yourself one of these major commands that we're to be separate. Now again, this is going to be important because we have to recognize there is something different in our life. And we have a command to continue to be different. Secret service Christians are not needed at this time. That God wants us to on purpose be different from the world. Be different in how we respond. Be different in how we react. Be different in our likes. Think about this. That if we're following God, we're going in one direction. The world and its system and its mindset is going a different direction. Therefore, we can't align up with the world and be following Christ at the same time. There's going to be a difference because our goal is different. Our mindset will be different. So our lives must be different. Notice in the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 6. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, notice with me in verse 14. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. That's a command. That's not one with wiggle room. That is a specific command. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness. So here it says, all right, let's prove our case. You are supposed to be different. So in order to prove it, what fellowship does righteousness have with unrighteousness? So let's say someone has decided to make a live a right life, live a correct life, to live a life that is correct, that is right. How are they going to get along with someone who always wants to do wrong? All right? So let's say that you're best friends with someone and you want to do what's right, but your best friend wants to go rob a bank. How is that going to work out? Not well, because you have different goals. They don't care to do right. They haven't made a cho choice to do right. And that's going to go in the difference. There's going to be a difference. There's going to be a friction between someone that's trying to do right and someone who doesn't care if they do right or wrong. The Bible says, what fellowship? How can you get along with someone and have a close-knit fellowship with someone who wants to do wrong when you want to do right. It's going to make people miserable. What fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? Now, there is always a separation between light and darkness. If we turned off all the lights and covered the windows and I took a flashlight, you could definitely see the light and you could see a border of the light. And then there's darkness. They don't mix together. You don't see darkness swirling inside of the light. You either have light or you have darkness. Well, we are the light of the world. We have a different light. And the world doesn't. There's going to be something different. What concord hath Christ with Belial? Belial is an old false god, but in the New Testament is often referenced to the carrying idea of Satan. So let's imagine we're going to have a worship service. And we want to have a joint worship service. And so over here we're going to have Christians. And over here we're going to have Satanists. And we all want to sing the same songs and have the same message. Will it work together? Not at all. Because there's a difference. There is no concord. There's no agreement. There's no working together. It, it's not it, the idea that it's because they don't want to. It's because they can't. Because there's a difference. Verse 16. And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? 
Now here it brings in. Let's do the idea of a church. All right, so here's a church. But because we want to get along with everyone, we're going to put a boot up here. And we're going to put a Hindu uh, symbol up here. Is it all going to match? Not at all. And so we can't even worship together. We can't even allow those things because there is a separation. All right, now that's practical. Now let's drive it home. Verse 16, and one agreement hath the temple of God with idols. For ye are the temple of the living God. For as God said, I will dwell in them and walk with them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. When you accept Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, the Holy Spirit, who is God, comes to live inside of you. And because God lives within you, you are automatically different because you have God living within you. But if you're going to follow after God and do the things that are pleasing to God, then we are not going to be able to participate in those things that are not right. Not if we're following after God. You say, well, how does this work? They have a certain tree that is the last tree to lose its leaves. It doesn't lose its leaves until actual spring. And the reason why it loses its leaves is because the new growth pushes out the old growth. And the old growth falls off. If we are following after Christ and he is our goal, then he, the Holy Spirit who lives within us, is naturally going to push those old things out of our life. You see, the goal for us is not to be different. If we make being different the goal, we have the wrong goal. Our goal is following after God. And as we follow after God, He will make us different. Does that make sense? Sometimes we just need to be reminding people that being different is not the goal. It is a byproduct of the goal. It is the inedible result of the goal. But the goal is God. This is one of the wonderful things with watching new Christians. As a new Christian decides to follow after Christ. As a new Christian says, I made a choice to follow after Jesus. We don't have to convince them that there are certain things they shouldn't do in their life. God will do the convincing. God will do the changing. May I say that God will even change the way you think. As you follow after Christ, the Holy Spirit who lives within you is going to make these changes. You take someone who got saved and made a decision to follow after Christ. Then take that person in even a year, two years, five years, and compare how they think. Even the way they think is different. The things that they enjoyed before have passed away. Things I love far more have come to stay. Things are different now. Something happened to me when I gave my heart to Jesus. You understand, <laughs> this is important. We do have to list and explain that we will be different. But with it, we also explain being different is not the goal. Christ is the goal. As we follow him, he will change us. He will make it so we no longer want to participate in those things. He changes our desires, changes the things we want to do, changes the things we participate in, that the goal is God. Notice as verse 17 now follows and summarizes this. Wherefore, so because of all of this, come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, and will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. So because of this, God says, I want you to be separate, and I want you to follow me. As you follow me, you will be different. So come out from among them, and be ye separate. Make a choice to follow after me. I will take care of the rest. That's a comfort that we have. But as we go back to the book of 1 Peter, we understand that we are strangers. We are people that are different and don't belong in this world. We are pilgrims. We are, live in this world, but we don't belong part of the world. We have to interact with it. But we are different. 
Which now brings us to the third thing I would like to bring here. And that is the power to change lives. The power to change lives. Notice with me in 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 2. 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 2. Elect according to the knowledge of God the Father. Through the sanctification of the Spirit. Unto the obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Notice this. The mention of the Father, the mention of the Son, and the mention of the Spirit. The entire Godhead is involved in our salvation. We are saved, we are sanctified because of the foreknowledge of God the Father. Through the sanctification, remember this word sanctification is the setting apart for the use of God by the Holy Spirit. And then it is because of the blood, and notice this, the obedience of Jesus Christ. Jesus had to, on purpose, obey the Father to provide us the salvation that we now enjoy. He could have chose, well, forget this, but he humbled himself. Obedience is the only thing in the Bible that it records that God ever learned. God knows everything. Obedience doesn't come from book knowledge. Obedience comes from experience. You have to, on purpose, obey. And Jesus came, knew everything in the world, but he had to learn for himself by experience, obeying, and this brought us salvation. The Holy Spirit had its part. God the Father had its part. Jesus had this part. And now, because of this, we could have grace and we could have peace multiplied because of this. Now, think about the people who were suffering. There was constant death of putting, uh, talk of putting them to death because they're Christians. What's going to happen, starting with Nero... Nero, who is the Roman emperor, decided to burn down Rome for his own jollies. He imagined himself as a great director. And it was reported that as Rome burned, there's an old saying that uh, Nero fiddled as Rome burned. The, what actually happened is he imagined, imagined himself as a great director. And as Rome was burning down, he imagined it as a big backdrop to a play. Well, when burnt, Rome burnt down, he went, oops, I think some people are going to be mad at this. Who can I blame? Well, Christians were easy and on hand. First of all, they had no home country. So he could blame them and don't, doesn't have to worry about starting a war. Second of all, because Christians were already different. And it is easy to blame people who are different. And so he put them to blame. Then what happens because of the permission of the government to cause persecution. By the way, there was persecution before this. But the government made it official. That just becoming a Christian and getting baptized could cause someone to lose their job. To get publicly baptized, you could actually be kicked out of the house. To get publicly baptized and announce that you are following after Christ could cause you to even be killed. Now, <laughs> baptism doesn't save anybody. What baptism is, is the first step of obedience. Are you willing to follow after God by getting wet? Now remember, baptism doesn't save you, doesn't wash away your sins. Why in the world do I get in a tank of water in front of people? Just to see if you're willing to obey. And if you're willing to obey something that doesn't wash away your sins, something that doesn't do anything for your salvation in front of everyone, you're probably also going to be willing to follow after God in other things. This is why obedience is, uh, the baptism is called the first step of obedience. It's seen if you're willing to obey. So when someone was willing to publicly get baptized, they were publicly willing to say, I am willing to follow after Christ. What happened is that they also started to be different. They started to speak different. They started to act different. And because of this, there was great persecution upon them, and it got worse and worse and worse and worse. We understand that there are periods of persecution. May we say that we're on the cusp. We are on the edge of persecution. America is the last place where we have some semblance of freedom as Christians, and that is fixing to end. Ten years ago, I couldn't imagine. I said, it's around the corner, but I didn't know how close. In Canada, they have underground churches. 
three years ago, we never would have said that. Already in places in America, they are not allowed to have church. Even still, they're not allowed to have church. They have already passed laws that put the beginnings of outlawing the Bibles by calling it hate speech. The laws are already in effect. There are other laws that will make it a crime if I try to counsel someone on certain subjects from the Bible. It's already law. It is coming to the place where you're going to have to make a choice to purposely follow after Christ because it's going to cost you something. Now is the time to start developing the habit of obedience to Christ. Imagine how hard it is already to get people to come to church and stay in church. (laughs) Ah, show up if I feel like it. Well, what happens when it's outlawed? Are they ever going to show up? Probably not. What's going to happen when the Bible's outlawed? By the way, the Bible's been outlawed Time after time after time after time. You take Henry VIII, who, by the way, was awarded the the, um, title Defender of the Faith by the Roman Catholic Church. Some people put him as a great Protestant guy. He was not a Protestant guy. He was Catholic who got mad at the Catholic Church and decided he was going to do his own thing. That's about a stint of his Protestantism. But he actually outlawed the English Bible. Made it illegal. Wonderful thing is that people in his own court, they had ladies with big fluffy dresses. They would smuggle in Bibles inside of the dresses inside of the palace so people could have it. Hitler outlawed the Bible. He would actually replace the Bible and put my cup, his personal book, up on there. It's documented. They would change the cross and make him put up a swastika. They made it so in Hitler, Germany, you had to have the government's permission in order to baptize anyone. And they had to have a Nazi official there to make it a Nazi baptism because they got baptized into the Nazi party. You know, that's less than 100 years ago. Those things can still happen as people. Again, it's a different time But the same effect, the Bible will be outlawed. It will be replaced. People will try to put something else. They'll change the symbols of God into their symbols. What are you going to (laughs) do? We understand we're living in a time where the book of 1 Peter is more important than ever. Because it's teaching us that if we're going to follow after Christ, we will be different. And we need to understand there will be a difference. Because we will not fit into a world that's ever changing. Now I'm talking about biblical Christianity. I'm not talking about American Christianity, which is weak and pathetic that will fold under any gust of wind. We're talking about people who believe the Bible and follow after the Bible. Those are going to be a remnant. And very few of them are going to be left who are willing to stand. Why? Because people have not developed the habit of following after Christ for themselves. So as we introduce the book of 1 Peter, we understand this, that being different is not the goal. However, the evidence that biblical Christianity is true is the evidence of a changed life. What makes us different? Not by choice, but by following after Christ. And as we follow after Christ, He will make us different. Thank you for listening to this audio message. This is Pastor Scotty Bockhaus, and I encourage you to take this information that you just received and make a specific decision to follow after the Lord. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, let me beg you to take the time to receive Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. If you are saved, I encourage you to make a decision in your life to help you get closer with the Lord. If there's anything specific we can do to be a blessing or to pray for you, we encourage you. Look us up on the internet at riverviewbc.com. Once again, that's riverviewbc.com. Or if you would prefer to call us, you can give us a call at area code 920 920- 
920-530-6308. Once again, that number is 920-530-6308. If there's anything we can do to be a blessing or an encouragement to you, please let us know. We would love to make ourselves available. Thank you.